Very honored to be sitting with Pat Conroy, who's the author of a brand new book called South Abroad. We are actually here at your home on Fripp Island. Um, you know, you write about in your books, uh, having moved so much as a child, that there was really never a place that felt like home. Does Fripp Island feel like home yet to you? You know, Beaufort certainly seemed like home to me. Uh, I latched on to Beaufort. It was the 23rd move I had because Dad was in the Marine Corps, 23rd I had since birth, and I came to Beaufort when I was 15. So I was miserable about moving again. I'd never heard of Beaufort, South Carolina. And I my mother said, why don't you make this your hometown? You know, you're a Marine kid. Any town you choose in America, you can make your hometown. So I latched onto this town like a barnacle. And poor Buford did not know what they were getting into, and I certainly did not know what they were getting into. But it has been, it has had the feel of home since I first drove in, you know, when I was 15. For South Abroad, you're actually, the, the, the star of this book is, is Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston, South. You've been to Charleston? I have been to Charleston. I don't think I've spent the quality time you've spent in Charleston, but it's a beautiful city. No, I fell in love with Charleston. I went over with um, my high school English teacher, Jean Norris. And Gene would call me up and say, let's go rambling, boy. And we went uh, to Charleston for the first time. He wanted to look at antiques. Gene was a big antique guy. And he took me up there and he goes, he had this great southern accent. He goes, Lord, Lord, boy, I'm going to change your life forever. I said, why, Mr. Norris? And he said, because I'm taking you to the holy city. I'm taking you to Charleston, boy. And that's magic in anybody's life. And I remember him driving down, we drove in, and we got to this one spot, a place called the Four Corners of Law. And he took a right and he said, now boy, this is really gonna change your life. I'm taking you south of Broad, the magical part of a magical city. And he did. And I, was blown away by the architecture, uh, the sheer beauty of Charleston. But Charleston is certainly one of the heroes of this book. You write about it so beautifully and so lovingly. Um, the, 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 the book opens with a scene with your, your, uh, your main character um, riding a bike through the streets of Charleston, and it's as lyrical a description of a city as you'll ever find. It was for fans of Pat Conroy uh, re-entry into this world that they know so well, this sort of beautiful prose that describes the city. Uh, for all of us, it's been 14 years since your last book. Does it oh, feel like that? Your last novel. I, your you last know, novel. Yeah. We'll talk about My Losing Season and other books, your nonfiction work in a little bit, but does it feel like that long to you, that it's been that long? For, no. us, for us, you've been gone for a long Here, time. My great surprise in life, Rich, and this is my great surprise, how fast time passed. And yeah, I can meet a student I taught at Buford High School. And I realize it's 35 years ago, which seems astonishing to me, almost 40 years ago in some instances. So the passage of time does seem uh, remarkable to me. And when they told me it was 14 years, I was going, my God, it took that long, but it did. It, you know, it took that long and it, I worked on my losing season as hard as I've ever worked on a novel. So it felt the same way. You know, I worked on the cookbook just as hard as I'd ever worked on a novel. And when I got to this, it felt like, you know, going back into a sea I had not been swimming in for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I liked it. Yeah, well, it feels great for those of us who, who know and love your work. The, um, the, the main character is uh, Leopold Bloom King, and he is named after a, a main character, the protagonist of Ulysses. And the, his brother, um, who we learned about at the beginning of the novel, is named Stephen Dedalus King, another character from Ulysses. And the mother is obviously a huge fan of, of the book Ulysses in the, in the book and celebrates Bloom's Day and, and whatnot. Are you a fan of, of Ulysses yourself? You know, I'm more of a fan of the kid in the book. Uh -huh. It's I'd read the book and it was, I remember I read it in high school and it was difficult for me. And it wasn't until I went back to it when I was in my 20s that I thought I got anything out of it at all. But what I had met in the meantime were Joyce scholars. Mm -hmm. 
And I'd never met these complete fanatics. Uh, you know, Bloomsday, there we go. And a lot of them would fly over to Dublin on Bloomsday and, you know, make that walk. And so it was interesting to me, and I met a woman who was completely berserk over James Joyce. I mean, there was not one thing this guy ever did, said, or breathed that she did not know about. Mm -hmm. So I used that for the mother of Leo King, Leopold Bloom King, and you've got to be a true fanatic of Joyce to name your children after that. And Leo says in the book, Mom, I'm Roman Catholic, and you name me for an Irish Jew who lives in B Dublin. Can you explain that? And it was her passion for Joyce, uh, her passion for language that uh, I loved. I just loved it. Mm -hmm. She's a really memorable character. The father is a really memorable character, too. And for fans of, of Pat Conroy, uh, this is a different type of father for you. This is a lovable, good father. Jasper is the name of the father. And um, unlike many of your stories, this is a this is a likable father. Did you purposely you know, <clears throat> make that transition? It was. I told myself before I died, I was going to write about a good father. <laughs> and you know, in my, in my books, fathers come roaring in. The kids are flying out of the way. Yeah. Kids are bleeding in the corner. Uh, you know, kids <laughs> are always in danger. They're always in peril. So I've watched, you know, people who are terrific fathers, and I always wish I had one like that. So I decided in this book, okay, I'm going to give this kid, he's going to have enough problems as it is, but I'm giving this kid a good one. And I fell in love with that, that father. People who've read your work know your relationship with your father, with Donald Conroy. You've talked about it a great deal. Um, he was the, the, the character behind uh, the great Santini, among other things. So. When you thought of this character, does this have any bearing on your relationship with your father, how it evolved um, at the end of his life? You know, it probably, he, my father, in fact, I'm writing a nonfiction book now about how my father changed. After the great Santini, he loathed that portrait of himself more than anything I've ever seen. You know, I had no idea. Uh, Dad reading, I didn't know he was going to read the book. He'd never read a book in his life. And he moved his lips. He used his index finger. I mean, I said, Dad, what is this? You're commenting on a novel? This is a rare and privileged land you are entering into. And he spent the rest of his life trying to prove that I was wrong. And he did a good job. I mean, all seven of his children, we all hated him. And then this book comes out. He did not like this unflattering portrait. So what he did? He found it in him to change, and all of us appreciated that change. But, you know, I doubt if he, inf now here's where Dad would get to me. I remember when the Prince of Tides came out, I made the father a shrimper. So my father comes over and says, hey, I hear I'm a shrimper this time, son. <laughs> I said, Dad, you couldn't catch a shrimp in a Long John Silvers. <laughs> and so Dad said, doesn't make any difference, son. And he said, I was such a powerful figure in your life that you can't write the word father without thinking of me. And he had me. He certainly had me. Yeah. But I could, after he died, you know, I could be grateful for what he became. But I wanted to write about a guy whose sweetness was the major part of this kid's life. Mm -hmm. and, and I saw it many instances of just males being nice and sweet. Mm -hmm. I almost tear up when I go to the grocery store and I see a father being nice to his kid. And it gets to me and I cannot help it because I did not have that. So making up Jasper, who is my grandfather's name, was Jasper, is I loved every minute of it. Yeah, so, so many of the characters in your books are based on people in your lives. You're famous for creating characters that have a, a close relation to you, whether it was your sister and the Prince of Tides or your father and the great Santini and other characters too. Is it difficult being a novelist in a world where you're chronicling things that you see and picking it up and then having to, to, to know those people <laughs> afterwards? How do you explain that to your friends it and family? Is, you know, people will read this book, they'll come to this book, and I'm starting to hear it now. 
And in one moment, we call it, I didn't even think of you when I was writing that character. You know, it's a dead ringer for me, Pat. It's just a dead ringer. And I said, I didn't know that. So it gets confused. You know, my right. family has been understandably uh, worried about how, you know, they will appear. Right. And my sister Carol, who's a poet in New York, uh, but I always love her, Carol. She'll call up and say, oh, gee, let me think. The main character, the narrator, will be a sensitive, fabulous child <laughs> of, you know, a rare ability to love. And his monstrous family is torturing him all around him. And, yes, that seems to be a theme of yours, Pat. And, but I've noticed you always make yourself look fabulous and great <laughs> and life-affirming. And <laughs> so... It, it comes from everywhere. Yeah, you know, it's the family grief. would. Uh, I went to Chicago to visit my grandmother one time, and I heard she was burning letters and photographs before I got there, so I could not, you know, dip into the family archives and betray still another branch. So it's been, you know, just part of my existence. But you know, I have had to get used to it. Right. Nothing I can do about it. They, right. Well, it's something you're obviously just drawn to. Yeah, it's, it's very odd, Richard. One way it's been odd is my brothers and sisters are a closed mouth tribe a lot. And so I wrote about all the brothers in beach music. Then you're always worried. You're always worried. And I had no idea if they'd read the book, not read the book, if they liked the book, not liked the book. You know, I don't get reviews much from the family. And I remember the Christmas, we were sitting around this room. And my brother Mike opened a present. And he said, and his hat he put on says, I'm Dupree from Beach Music. Jim put on, I'm Dallas from Beach Music. And Tim put, I'm T from Beach Music. And it was their way of telling me. They liked it. It was all right. Yeah. Um, and they even appreciated it. But no verbal communication passed between us. Mm -hmm. You know, another big part of, um, of South Abroad is the fact that the mother and the father are both teachers. Um, and there's a nobility to teachers in your work that, that resurfaces again and again. Uh, I know you were a teacher, and you wrote about it in The Water is Wide, and you've talked about teachers in your career since then. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you perceive that profession and, and when you were writing this book, your thoughts about the teaching profession in general and these characters? You know, I, have, I loved my teachers growing up as much as anything. And of course, I love that they didn't beat me up. That was, you know, a great thing they had going for them. And I also loved that they took time out to teach me things. And I can remember various stages of my life when a teacher would hand me Huckleberry Finn when I was in seventh grade, or a teacher first taught Shakespeare when I was in ninth grade, or a teacher had a great teacher named Joseph Monty, Gonzaga High School, who just, I'll never forget him coming in, and he said, uh, he said, what a shame, none of you read a thousand books then at least perhaps we could begin a conversation. So I was dying to go out to read a thousand books. And every one of these years, Gene Norris, Millen Ellis, I had these magnificent English teachers that just could not have been nice when I went to the Citadel. And I think I was one of four English majors my first year. There just was unheard of at a military college to major in that. But my English teachers loved it, the jock, a uh, guy love learning English, love Chaucer, love Milton, love Shakespeare. I just went nuts for it all. And I thought I was living the luckiest life a human being could live. And I felt privileged beyond any measure and loved the teachers, and I still love them to this day. I want to talk about The Citadel a little bit in your, in your book, My Losing Season, um, which you said you worked on as hard as any novel. Um, it's a great story. It's a nonfiction story. It's the story of your life um, and, and being at The Citadel and 
um, basketball, uh, a sport that you love. Um, the Citadel, you had sort of an uncomfortable relationship with for a while. I'm not sure you ever felt any differently about it, but they were uncomfortable with the Lords of Discipline after it came out and your depiction of that. Uncomfortable? <laughs> I was yes, they were. Put it mildly. Um, but since then, things have turned for the better. You've been welcomed back to the Citadel. Um, your, I think your brother is, um, is the baseball coach at the Citadel? Basketball, the basketball coach. coach. My first cousin is yeah. basketball coach. Yeah, there you go. It's a relative. Um, so what has it like been sort of being pushed down the outside of the Citadel then being brought back in? Well, the pushback uh, lasted 30 years. <clears throat> being brought back is uh, fairly rare still. You know, I mean, it's, it's, um, and I did not realize that uh, the Lords of Discipline, the battle over that would pale in significance to the battle of Shannon Faulkner going right. there. And when I came out for Shannon Faulkner, it got really serious. And Shannon Faulkner was the first uh, female uh, cadet. Yeah, oh yeah. my God. I mean, they just, you know, you're trying to ruin the school and you're trying to do this. And, uh, and you were vocal in her, you were a big supporter of Shannon Faulkner at the time. I'm sorry? You were a big supporter of Shannon Faulkner. A big supporter and a big supporter of women going to the Citadel. And, oh my God, I thought, I thought there would be no recovery whatsoever. You know, I had people leaping on a car, shooting me the bird, uh, telling me exactly what they thought on King Street in Charleston. And, you know, one guy read me the riot act, jumped in his car, then came out, the bird shooting again, and he said, class of 59. And so he jumps back in, having identified himself. So it was a shock to me when the Citadel um, made peace offerings. And that was after you ever feel like there was danger in, in coming out for Shannon Faulkner? They did. They did. And they got it to a time where they thought it was safe. Uh, Greg Smith and Mary, his wife on the island, would tell me when they thought it was safe to go to a football game, you know, when I wouldn't be mobbed and killed. And they monitored it pretty well. And so, you know, they were, there was some tension at first. Uh, some real animosity at first, but eventually they got used to it. And now I am a, a beloved son of the Citadel. Has it changed then? I mean, is, when you go back, I mean, do the uh, alumni, are you welcomed now or is there still tension? Oh yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, I go, because of my cousin, Ed, I go to basketball games a lot up there. And he had his first, we had the Citadel's first 20 game winning season last year. And I went up and uh, it was exciting. Saw the gym filled, which I'd never seen in my life. So it's, uh, I've been very grateful. The Citadel has seen fit to get me back in to the core, back into the long gray line. Because mm -hmm. I thought it would never happen. Mm -hmm. In almost all of your books, there's an element of sports somewhere. Basketball, football. Mm -hmm. um, you're obviously a, a huge sports fan and played sports growing up. Um, in this book, that's no different. Um, there's the, the football coach and Ike, his son, um, who's a part of the group of people that, um, that, that befriend the main character, Leo. Um, how important is sports to your life overall? Well, okay, this is Dad, growing up in Dad's house. We went to new schools every year. Dad, when he went to enroll me, also enrolled me for football, basketball, and baseball. He never asked whether I wanted to do it, whether I was happy to do it. Uh, it just was expected. So I grew up with this, and and I met coaches that I loved, and you know, they, you know these guys, and and that's where I saw good fathers. Some of these kids were raised by these gentle, wonderful men, and so. It was a place, you know, that I could find acceptance. Um, I was never a very good athlete, uh, but it, it gave me an avenue, you know, out of that house of Santini, which I always took when I could. And even though Dad never, you know, came to any games, you know, he did not seem to care about that part. But you know, in his philosophy of fatherhood, you know, the son plays sports. The, the girl, I mean, it was very um, regimented in what we're supposed to be and what we're not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But 
He was tough. When after a game, if he came, it was when you got hit, mm -hmm. because you'd never satisfy uh, Dad completely, and he backhanded me after I scored forty-three points in a um, basketball game in high school. What did you do wrong there? And I didn't play good enough defense. <laughs> and I thought, this was, uh, but it was, it was. Part of my life and part that I, I especially love writing my losing season, Rich, because I got to go back and tell those guys I was sorry I abandoned them. And I just left them and never looked back. They never looked, we lost, we were a losing team. And all of us felt agony over that year. And uh, we've become very close. They signed with me now. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, this book took 14 years, uh, obviously not this book alone, but to, to get from one fiction book to the next fiction book, your work done others in between. Um, how do you write? Do you sit down and spend every day on it, or do you take some time away from it, or, or how does your writing process work? Anytime I can. Um, you know, my problem, and this is getting to be, this brands me as a troglodyte, is I still write by hand. And I see my wife writing her novels, and you know, Cassandra is. I walk by her room, and her hand looks like hummingbird wings. I mean, <laughs> you know, I can't even see her fingers, they're moving so fast. And then she'll take a paragraph, you know, move it to the last chapter, move it to the first chapter. Um, and I realize I've harmed myself in this, but Dad would not let me take typing. Uh, in high school, and the Citadel offered no typing courses. I could take a course in bazooka or flamethrower, but none in typing. So, you know, I've been, I've fairly crippled myself in the amount of time it takes me. Well, plus, um, when I first started reading about South Abroad coming, um, word was that it was, you know, upwards of 700 pages or more, um, and that you were still working on it. And the, the finished book I'm looking at is in the 500, so clearly you write a lot that doesn't make it into the book, um, and that you let large chunks of the novel go. Is it, first of all, is that difficult? And secondly, if doing it by hand, that's a lot of extra work, obviously. Yes, it is. And I am trying to get, uh, <laughs> I don't quite know, what to be, you know, gigantism has been a problem I've had you know, from the very beginning. And, you know, I think I cut, 500 pages from Prince of Tides, I cut 450 from Beach Music. This was 1,200 pages at one time. Wow, do you miss those pages when they're gone? You know, it's, it's one of those things that, you, you know, now publishing, because of the changes in publishing, I think my publishing company now wishes I would, would write haiku. <laughs> And they would like to see, you know, something tiny and small, you know, that they could push out. Right. And it's, they want it shorter, shorter, shorter. And maybe the attention span of American readers is becoming less and less because of the Internet. Mm -hmm. And I've heard lots of theories I don't know. And it just makes me feel, you know, old-fashioned. And that used to worry me, except I am now old. And so, you know, you got to, you know, keep up with that. But I still like to read and I still like to write by hand. So I think this will continue for a while. We talked a little bit earlier about your own reading habits. Um, you described yourself as a voracious reader, someone who's constantly reading all the time, even when you're writing. Unbelievably voracious. Yeah, I can attest to that. I'm in your house and there's books everywhere you look, huge bookshelves full of uh, well-read books. Um, is it something that influences your writing while you're reading something There's else? There's no question. It doesn't influence why, you know, I've had writers tell me they can't read when they're writing a book. Uh, the, the reading feeds me as a writer. Mm -hmm. I always liked it. And I always love it when I come across something and I say, ooh, you know, boy, that's good. Uh, that novelist, he, she, what a great thing. And, you know, You'll, come, you'll stumble into these books that are just fabulous. And usually you listen to people, mm -hmm. and they'll tell you what's good. And they were, you know, I've got about five to ten people who tell me what they, re and, you know, it's good to have it spread out. Mm -hmm. And they will come in. You'll tell me the name of a book, 
before you leave here because it's obvious you read all the time. And you'll tell me one that I would not have heard of if you had not been in this house. Uh, these guys will tell me, I hope, ones that they've read. So it's like a, a wireless system mm -hmm. that you get going and you get the clues that, that help, the clues that count about, you know, what to read. And you don't want to waste your time. You know, you want to read the good things. So do you browse bookstores and, and, and shop like that or do you... It, it is, there was one, the old New York bookshop in Atlanta that I walked into in 1973 and I didn't own a hardbound book. And so I walked into this store, and it was an antiquarian bookstore. So I didn't know there was such thing as an antiquarian bookstore. So I looked around, I bought two paperbacks that day. And then over the years, I bought thousands of hardbound books. And then as I brought them home, books looked beautiful to me. You know, they're up on a shelf, and I say, that looks good. You know, I like the way that looks. And one of my favorite titles for a book is Anthony Powell's um, Books to Furnish a Room. And I believe that, and it's uh, a great comfort to me. But I'm grateful that I can read a book and not have it affect how I write or think. Mm -hmm. And the reading goes on uh, nonstop when I'm writing, too. Well, that's very clear, because when I read South Abroad, I felt Pat Conroy's writing style come back to me again. I felt the entire world of your writing return after a long break for me. And uh, it was great to have it come back. It was like revisiting an old friend. And I think your fans are going to love South Abroad as much as, as I did. And uh, I just appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to us today. It has been a pleasure. Yeah. My first interview. Yeah. It's great to meet you. Thanks so much. It's an honor.